Is Washington a top 10 team? Pro Football Focus thinks so. You are Locked On Huskies, your daily podcast on the Washington Huskies, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back in to another edition of the Lockdown Huskies podcast. I'm Roman Tomashoff. That's Lars Hansen. He's site editor with Athlon Sports Inside the Huskies. I'm the site editor with Huskies Wire. Thank you for making this your first watch or first listen today as we are part of the Lockdown Podcast Network. And today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Now, Lars, as you said in the opener, Pro Football Focus released their preseason power rankings for the top 25 teams in college football. And I think you and I were both pretty shocked to find Washington number top at number nine, which, you know, that's his own discussion. We're going to get into that. We're going to talk about some of the positives, some of the negatives. Let's have a little fun with it. Which, which side are you on? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Somewhere in the middle there. So I'm going to take the dissenting view for the simple reason sure. of – we're, if you're a top 10 team, you're, you're 10 and 2 at the end of the year. That's a fair assessment. We, I have both, I have maintained their 8 and 4, potentially at the high end, 9 and 3. So being in the top 25, okay, you know what? I'll, I could give you that if you're 20, 25 through 18. I'll give you that. But 9? Oh, especially when you, I was talking to somebody yesterday and I ran through the, actually, when I pull back the curtain here, I was up at Abe Lucas's camp on Sunday or on Saturday, and I was running through the uh, Washington starting offensive line. I was like, you have a GECO tackle. You have a left guard who's coming back from an ACL injury, an FCS center, a four, former four-star center, a four-star right guard who hasn't who started one or two games in his career at Ohio State, and then Drew as a party at right tackle. To me, sure. I need to see it. Now, and here's the thing: if it happens to boom, if it happens to boom, great. PFF can say they called it, but I don't genuinely, I can't genuinely say with a straight face that yes, this will be a top ten team, or even and even a top ten team going in. Like that's that's the other side of the thing for me. It's I don't see how you can comprise this roster with given everybody that left either to the draft or the portal, and say it's a top ten team. And that's no disrespect to the guys on the team. This could very well be a top twenty five team this fall. But I would be very, very, very surprised to see it above top 15. So I couldn't agree with you more. And I, I'm i going to sit on the other side here just because I'm, I might fence it a little bit. You know, we'll, see, we'll, we'll see what we've got going on here. But this is a really interesting thing when we look at everything that's involved in this. Because Pro Football Focus, uh, just to be complete, completely honest, they base this off of five criteria. Strike the schedule. The projected win total, projected chance to make a bowl game, projected chance to win the conference, and projected chance to win a national championship. So that's what they're basing this on. And that's fine. That's all, you know, whatever you want to think about it. But you're you're right. The offensive line is going to be a major question mark. If they can figure that out, I think that this team could truly surprise some people. But let's talk about some of the, the real strengths of this team. Washington has a really solid quarterback in Will Rogers. I think that Will Rogers is going to be massively underrated. Just, and he kind of has been already throughout this process. When we look at things just, you know, from the national media's perspective, I'm super excited about college football 25. But the more I look at it, the more I'm just kind of shocked that Washington isn't around top 25. And probably a lot of that has to do with the offensive line. A lot of that has to do with as much as we both love Denzel Boston, he doesn't have a whole lot of catches at the college level. So they're not going to rate him super highly. There are a whole lot of reasons why Washington is not getting a lot of love from a national perspective. That's fine. It is what it is. But Will Rogers is going to be a more than adequate quarterback for this team. Is he going to be Michael Penix? No, but we know that. Washington has two really solid running backs and Gerald Coleman and Cameron Davis. PFF, shout out to him. And maybe this plays into it a little bit. Had him as the top graded transfer running back for the entire nation. That's ahead of Quinshawn Judkins. That's ahead of a whole bunch of these other guys that are really, really high, highly rated players that could go in the first, second round of the NFL draft. And then on the other side of the ball, because, you know, I talked about Denzel Boston, Jeremiah Hunter. Obviously, we know that he's going to be a stud in his own, own right in 2024. This is going to be a really solid defense, especially on the back end, where we think about Carson Bruner and Alfonso Tupatala. That is arguably the most experienced linebacker core in the country when you look at, you know, just the amount of years that you have and experience between them and how both of them played last season. 
And then you look at Ephesians Prysock on the outside, Elijah Jackson, Thaddeus Dixon, Justin Harrington, Jordan Shaw, Cameron Fabiculana, Michaela Steen, uh, Cameron Broussard, just all of these guys. You keep going and name a whole lot of really, really talented players in a scheme that I think has the potential to be one of the best in college football. Now, these are these all sound like very positive things, and they're they all very well could be, but it's still unproven under Jed Fish. So I certainly was a little baffled by this ranking, but I understand where it could be coming from, especially with the criteria that they gave. So I'm with you on two fifths of those criteria because you mentioned some of the you know the the the, the PFF grades and things like that, but you look at the chance to win the Big Ten. You have Ohio State. You have Oregon. You have well, Michigan's kind of down, but. I guess besides oh, Penn State is probably going to be up there and you, and you travel to Penn State. So when you start breaking down the list of expected win totals, over under is, I believe, seven and a half on FanDuel. Correct me if I'm wrong yeah, on that. Same. Maybe not. But it, last time I checked, that hasn't moved. And their odds to win the national championship or play in the national championship, I believe, are over 1,200. I could be wrong on that, but I know they're certainly not among the top 10 teams in the country in terms of FanDuel odds. Now, again, is we love FanDuel. Is that the ultimate metric? No, but it is. PFF, the ultimate metric? No. I think it's, again, the answer here is somewhere in the middle. Washington could very well be a top team in 2025 with the right pieces added to it, which we'll talk about later in the show. But I just look at this team, and there is a ton of potential. But the thing is, as you mentioned those names, Cameron Davis come, didn't play last season with the ACL. Jonah Coleman, as much as I love Jonah Coleman, we both love Jonah Coleman, didn't rush for 1,000 yards last season. It was kind of a, you know, one of the few backs at Arizona. Right. And, and no, again, sorry, I, I, there's, there's a lot of factors. Go for it. Because well, because I agree with you there. But also, Jonah Coleman, and I put this out over on, on Huskies by the other day, Jonah Coleman averaged seven and a half yards per touch. He had 153 touches, took him for 1,100 scrimmage yards. Like, that's that's nothing to sneeze at right there. That's So I, I agree with you there, but I because I don't think that, just in, the, in that same vein, that rushing for 1,000 yards really tells the whole story there. No, I, I agree. I'm just when you combine the two together, where Davis is Davis doesn't ha- he has production in 22, sure. but not 23. And then this is a whole new offense, a whole new scheme. And and you look at you know the tight the tight ends. I know again, you start to get into the intricacies of things. And you mentioned Justin Harrington on defense. There's a lot of new faces on defense. Obviously, we can safely bet on Carson Bruner, Tuputala, probably a few fry sock and a couple others. But Justin Harrington didn't play more than two games last season because of the ACL. There's a number of guys who, if they live up to their potential, like, hey, in a if this is a best-case scenario ranking, yes, then I could, I could maybe start to see where Washington is a top-10 team in a best-case scenario at the end of the season. My only two questions are, is this coming into the season, or is this, hey, Washington will be a top-10 team by the end end of the season when all is said and done because we're looking at their strength of schedule it should work out favorably well because i have i know you haven't seen anybody really give a lot of offseason awards to washington or any washington players there's been a couple and i'm sure carson bruno will get some potentially all conference nods preseason wise and things like that but they're not coming in with a lot of fanfare which is fine but then just it's just on the flip side to see this top you know number nine ranking i I get it. It's great because we can have a discussion about it. I just don't know how much I buy into it. And as much as we both love when PFF fits the narrative, on one hand, this fits the narrative perfectly because, hey, we would love to, hey, you know, Washington's a top 10 team, this and that. They're going to, you know, go to the CFP. I don't think either of us can say that with a straight face on July 2nd. Now, on October 10th, you know, when we're seven, eight games into the season, six, seven games into the season, and you're going to Iowa in that big weekend – then it's a different story if you're five and one, six and two, because now you've been able to show it and there'd be a little more credence to it. I just, for me, taking the, you know, journalistic step back approach, I would rather sh- be proven wrong than buy into something that I totally can. not Again, there's a lot of great pieces, but how they all fit together. And if God forbid, one of these offensive linemen goes down before or during the season, like you're already no, thin I, as it is, and getting less experience does not help in that regard. No, I, I could agree with you more there. And it, it's it's going to be an interesting thing to watch. And just a good way to put a bow on it is, yeah, this this might not be a top 10 team right now. Is the potential there? Sure. But we'll see in fall camp, which is open in a couple of weeks. And Lars, that being said, Donovan Olabodi is announcing his commitment on Friday. And 
And we'll get that right after message from our good friends over at Game Time. Because with killer last minute deals, all in prices, views from your seat, and their lowest price guaranteed, Game Time takes the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets. And hey, you know what? Huge shout out to them for that. Because as we're recording this, right after the after we finish recording this, I am going to be on my way to the Mariners game to watch them take on the Baltimore Orioles. And shout out to Game Time for helping me find the absolute lowest price seats to help you know just get me in the door. And we're gonna have a, a great night. And some of the great things about Game Time is their last minute deals. You can save. 60% off buying last minute for sports, concerts, comedy theater, and so much more. They got flash deals. You can save even more with exclusive in-app deals on select seats ahead of the game or event. They got all-in pricing, which is what I love to use to help just, you know, no hidden fees and, and, and or anything else like that at checkout. It just shows you your total right there up front. Makes buying so easy. And with the game time ticket covers, your purchase is covered with the most flexible customer service policy in the ticketing industry. You can take the guesswork out of buying MLB tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown College for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code L O C K E D O N C O L L E G for twenty dollars off. And download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest prices guaranteed. So, Lars, there have been a lot of rumblings about Donovan Olabody over the last couple of weeks. Your guys over at Rivals.com have named a Washington leader. Adam Gorney came out, put in a prediction for uh, Donovan Olabody, who's now committing on July 5th, to choose the Huskies, which would be a huge win. And we, you know, talked about this a little bit on our Monday show where I very proudly, you know, planted my flag and said, no matter what else happens, Zadrius Rainey Sale will be the crown jewel of this Washington class. And I stand by that for more of the off-field reasons than on-field. But if Donovan, Donovan Olabody commits to Washington on Friday, that would just signal a whole new era of Washington football, of recruiting under Jed Fish, and just a whole step in a different direction, which I really want to get into. But I, I want to hear what you have to say about this, about, you know, just what development at Washington will look like. Because there are a lot of similarities between him and a, a, a one of arguably the best receiver in college football right now. I was gonna say, I think you're talking about T Mac. That's that's the oh, one. Yeah. And if you're Kevin Cummings, and if you're Kevin Cummings, think about this. We both love Jamarcus Shepard. In less than six months, I know this is this is a want to talk about bold statements. Here we go. Kevin Cummings has lapped Jamarcus Shepard in six months, and I'm talking about what Shepard was did in this entire time at Washington as a recruiter. If, let's Donovan, as, 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 as a, I, no, no, I don't, no, no, as just a recruiter because again, that, that just yeah, thank you for that because I, I was that I was in my head already thinking that, but yeah, just on the recruiting show, Kevin Cummings has gone around the moon a couple of times already. This would be. Really, I think, and I know you said ZRS was a crown jewel. I think it, this just is a whole different mode. We talked about it, it before is. the show. How hard and what it would mean for Washington, the furthest upper left, to go all the way down to the state of Florida and pull off a massive coup against, we're, we're talking about, you know, not Ohio State, but we're talking about major power schools that are recruiting him. USC and Oregon is the rest of his top five. Sorry, I just want to make sure we got that in there. No, you're good. I was I was gonna try and perfect assist because to me, it, this isn't just oh hey, you're you're getting a guy that Florida didn't want, FSU didn't want, or you know none of these big schools would want, but he's somehow a four star. This is a marquee player, and when we look back in two or three years, we, we talk about the guys that are going to be needing to start next season as freshmen. Just roll out this receiver, receiver trail. You're you're good. Like what we we talked about, it's going to be near impossible to replace that trio of Polk, McMillan, and McMillan, or Polk, Polk, Jim McMillan, <laughs> Roma Junze, and, and Jalen Polk. Sorry, there's there we go. so we many that. names going on. Um, but man, I I would be pressed. I think if you give me three years, they that group might might just edge those guys out. That's that's a bold statement. I know. But man, in year one, Jed Fish gets all the flowers if he can pull that off. I'm not gonna go that far. I I can't, especially you know. Shout out to Jalen Polk who's gonna tear it up for my New England Patriots this fall, and shout out to Roma Dunze who'll be tearing it up on all my fantasy teams this fall. Gotta gotta, gotta make sure that that that's in there somewhere. I hear you. I. I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying, but I I want to take a different approach here, where because I I like your whole thought process here, but this is and this is why we have the show because I didn't think about this in any of those ways at all. The way I thought about this 
was, you know, we get a lot of Arizona fans in our comments talking about Jed Fish for one reason or another, which is its own it's its, its own thing that I don't want to get into, which I, I think is pretty funny. Uh, but what I what I do want to get into is one of the most impressive things that Jed Fish did in Arizona, which was in his very first year. And Kevin Cummings, as you said, gets all this all the credit for this. Got to Tyro McMillan to flip from Oregon to Arizona on National Signing Day. That was their biggest win in in terms of recruiting in their three years at Arizona. It was number thirty seven ranked player in the country, fourth ranked receiver. What did he do in his true freshman year? He comes in, has thirty nine catches for seven hundred eighty yards and eight touchdowns. I am not by any stretch of the imagination saying that if Donovan Olabodi comes to Washington, that's what his true freshman year would be, because it would be just unfair to put those expectations on anybody. But what I am saying is that we could see him take a similar development track because we've heard Jed Fish say on numerous occasions that he wants to build through the ranks of high school recruiting. We talked about a lot on this show that he wants to build through the ranks of high school recruiting and he wants to play freshman early. And this is the dude you do that with. He's listed at six foot one, 200 pounds. He's got insane measurables. He's got 35 inch arms, 10 and a half inch hands. That, that's a dude who's ready to play right now. Where I remember, like, even when you, because the only comparison I'll draw here to Rome and McMillan, especially, is I remember when those two guys got here, and obviously it's COVID season, obviously the whole other uh, just circumstances there. I didn't think they were very ready to play in that first year. I, I just didn't. I thought that they both could have stood to add a couple of pounds, and they did that. And they did a fantastic job developing throughout the course of their career. But Donovan is different in that way. I think that he'd be ready to come in and I'm not going to say star, but I want to say play a part in the rotation from day one, which would be huge because we can talk about all the different things that, that means where you and I have had some very spirited discussions about what it means to recruit in the state of Florida. And especially for you know a school that doesn't really do that in Washington, where this would open up doors where Donovan's not from Florida. He goes to IMG. He transferred in there. So that's its own discussion, but I just think that when I just the more that I look at this, it signifies that Washington is willing to develop these guys and take their their licks early, and then you know as a sophomore as a junior, just say yeah, this guy's gonna be one of the best players in the country. We know that because what was Tyro doing his sophomore year? Fourteen hundred yards. He was fantastic. It's amazing, and I think that we could see some of that just just like a similar path taken with Donovan. And it could just be a microcosm of what we might see Washington turn into under Jim fish. I think it's what's what I think it's what Washington is turning into and in, in, kind of before our eyes with this recruiting. Sure. If they're again, if, sure. if they're able to pull it off that that's kind of the big caveat here, but you mentioned it. I mean, I think, and I'm talking, I'm sure you, you heard similar things, but recruits kind of this day and age, especially with this class who's saying, you know what? it's not as abnormal to go across the country to play college football. As long as you know you're the spot you're going, you're going to win. Like they don't care. It used to be five, 10 years ago. Wow. Getting a guy from, you know, California all the way to Florida and vice versa. Usually those guys might commit, but then would we'll flip on sign and they end up staying home and, and just whatever reason it never really worked out. But this seems kind of like a, it's a new trend where or it's an, it's a growing trend where I think that's why you hire Jed fish and, and we talked about his emphasis in recruiting from day one. He hit the ground running both in the portal and on the recruiting in the high school recruiting ranks and Kevin Cummings. And that, that's the other thing I want to mention. They didn't give up because you, we mentioned that May 31st visit weekend when they had all these guys come in and it was okay. What if anything is going to come of this? Is, is it, is it going to pay off in the end or are you just getting a visit and it kind of trails off? We thought it might've trailed off a little bit. I wrote on Athlon back in early June. Actually, it was about a month ago now when Donovan Oldboy was wearing a Washington backpack. People say, oh, it's just for cloud. It's just for cloud. The reason I wrote that story, what I said in the piece was, who does that? I mean, think about that. Think about when was the last time somebody used Washington for cloud who wasn't from yeah. the state of Washington or on the West Coast? Like, that was my point. Is it was, so, okay, if it's a cow, I, I want to say it. There, there's something I want to say. Uh, I, I just want to say Troy Franklin wearing the gloves in 2021. I've, I've, I just have to okay. say it every. You know, you know, that's that's it. That's why I had a discrepancy between backpack and gloves. Andrew Marsh, yeah. to your point, wear Washington gloves at the Rivals Cup. Everybody can wear gloves. You do whatever you toss them. You call sure. I mean, uh, uh, Tobias Merrill also wore gl Washington gloves 
at um that seven on seven, the, the COVID seven on seven that um, sure, sure, sure. the Hopkins hosted a couple of years ago. The gloves I don't put a lot of stock into. As what did Will Conroy used to say? If you put put washing on your back, you know, don't put washing on your back, put washing on your back. Like that sort of thing. Yeah. When you put the whack back on, and that's from your visit, and you have you can he could have put any backpack on the fact that you're walking around flaunting Washington and maybe people just aren't picking up on it. You know what? Well, like, yeah, this is, this is feeling nice. Like I like this. Nobody's, nobody's bagging on me. Say why are you wearing a washing gear? Cause they just went to the national championship. So all of this is a perfect kind of timing situation where you're coming off the national championship. You have the cachet and you have a relentless staff who's, killing it on the recruiting show and a coach in Kevin Cummings who also knows how to develop receivers. They saw that in Arizona. So I think all these three things are working together. And yeah, people are might be surprised, but the more we talk about it, the less I'm going to be surprised if Washington actually ends up getting his signature on signing day. Sure. No, I, I like where we're going with that. Lars, let's switch gears a little bit. Let's talk some basketball. So Lars, basketball has always been a really important thing to the Seattle community. Basketball has always been a really important thing to just Washington in general, really. When you think about the traditions of Gonzaga hoops, and what's that been? That's been for the last 15, 20 years, whatever you want to call it at this point. You talk about what the the Huskies are at their peak. And I I'm not going to talk about the Sonics and you know, just that's sour memories for everybody there. Uh, but what I what I do want to talk about is Danny Sprinkle has a real opportunity to make basketball truly matter in the city of Seattle again. And I'm really excited about it. And I think that I, you know what? I'm just going to stake my claim right now as we record this. It's 1 51 PM on Tuesday, July 2nd, Washington is going to make the NCAA tournament this year and they're going to win at least one game. And while that might not sound, you know, so bold in terms of some of the top 25, top 30 teams in the country where that's the expectation, that hasn't been the expectation here for the last handful of years. And I I really do think that Danny Sprinkle, who, you know, obviously is a Washington guy, has a Washington background. His dad played football at UW. That you can go down the list of all those things as to why he's probably going to be here for a while, in my opinion. But on top of that, He's just a really good coach and has put together a pretty awesome roster, in my opinion. No, he I could I completely agree with that assessment. I say, and what's funny is you mentioned that though, when I looked around um Joe Rothstein, you know, there's a couple other basketball national basketball guys that have put out top 40, top 30, whatever you want to call it. Aaron Torres, I believe, does something similar. Washington hasn't been on any of them, and it's a little perplexing because you would think, okay, is it you know, did he go and get, you know, multiple five stars? No. But I think what we've seen from Danny Sprinkle, both at Montana State and at Utah State, is he knows that this is why I love Mike Hoffman. He was a great person, a great guy, a great coach, just in terms of as a, as a person. He was always great with his players. But Danny Sprinkle is a young veteran coach because I mean, he's not a true veteran, like long standing. Yeah. But he clearly knows how to build a program. He did it at Montana State with limited resources, he did it at Utah State in Logan with. What's going on also, there? You know, just like, resources. Yeah. Right. And, and so now you're coming to Seattle with a brand recognition in Washington, a fan base that is absolutely dying for something the match with football gave them last year. And I'm not saying you make an Elite Eight run, you make a Final Four run this year. But I guarantee you, that's Danny's plan at Washington. He knows what it's going to take. He kind of has a three year plan of, okay, I need to get this the you know, 25, 27 win, you know, 20 to 27 wins my first year, if not more, you know, just kind of set the benchmark because the last time Washington won 20 plus games, you have to go back to, I believe what, 2019, 2018, you know, somewhere in that ballpark when they made the tournament last. And ever since then, it's just been kind of 17, 16, 17, whatever you want to call it. And Danny knows that's not acceptable. You don't go pay that buyout to get Danny Sprinkle after one season at Utah state. Right. And we've seen the investment that has been made just across the board with the basketball program. And I think for me, getting the amount of veteran transfers that he did, when we look at the roster, and it, it, it's different than what Hopkins did last year. We just brought in a bunch of grad transfers. All of these guys, you're talking about, you know, Mickey Mason, a junior, um, great Osibor senior, get kept on back. There's a number of guys who are both junior and seniors 
while also getting two very talented freshman guards in Zoom Diallo and Jace Butler. To me, yeah. that's the other key with this, where you're getting these guys who had a little bit of a relationship beforehand. They met at Damian Lillard's camp uh, last summer. And also now there's the Trevor Reason relationship and things like that. So everything is kind of working in Danny Sprinkle's favor. And it just seems like this – and I, 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 this is going to sound – like a true shot, but I truly don't mean it as a shot to Hopkins, but this is what it means to have an actual college basketball coach. A guy who knows how to do it. Isn't just an assistant coach who watched somebody do it and kind of could just play the assist role and, and, and do, and do a job being a head coach at this level. And especially in the modern age of college basketball, you got to do way more than just, okay, we like this guy. We like that guy. I, any, everything I've seen from sprinkle tells me he has a two a plan for year one year two and year three. Because so year three, he wants to be hitting the ground running. Like he already wants to be, you know, hey, we're 28, 28 is coming in is the expectation. Not, hey, we're kind of hoping to win 20 games and we'll see what happens. And so for me, yeah. there hasn't been any indication on the recruiting trail or otherwise as to say, I mean, and and the thing that's also nice is Danny Sprinkle's still humble about it. The fact that he didn't think he was going to get your great Osabor was kind of telling. It's like, it's not that he didn't have a good relationship with him, but who could fault great for wanting to go spread his wings and do his own thing for one last season. That tells me like sprinkle is a guy that players will die for. And we used to hear that a little bit under Hopkins where they would say, well, oh, I'd run through a brick wall for that guy. It's like, yeah, but you don't even die for a loose ball for that guy. How are you going to run through a brick wall for him? Sure. So sprinkle, I actually believe it. I know. I like where you're going with that. I just want to, because one thing that, that uh, Danny did mention is he's been making the, the podcast rounds a little bit. And um, one thing he did say was that there were higher, NIL offers out there for great Osibor when he chose Washington, which can't say I'm shocked by that. And, but it just says something about why great decided to stay with him. I, I, in my opinion where, yeah, he could have gone to Texas tech, Louisville, wherever he probably could have committed to Kentucky if he wanted to, but he dropped Kentucky straight up dropped him. And that was before the Calipari thing that was before all that. And I just, I think that there's so much, that could be said about him as a person. I really like the staff he's put together. Like he, this is just a dude who gets it in, in my opinion. And it's, it's, I, I really like, I'm, I'm sure there's some people who are yelling at me. Ah, oh, it's silly to just say that without any context, but I feel like that's the best way to describe it right now where we haven't seen him coach a game at Washington, but look at what this dude has done. He gave Tony Bland a shot where there were certainly tons of other schools that wanted to do that because before everything happened with the FBI investigation, he was one of the best assistant coaches in the country and getting him says a lot about what Danny can be putting Abdul Gaddy on the staff says a lot about what Danny wants to do. And there were people that said, Oh, well, why wasn't it? Will Conroy wasn't Quincy, Quincy Pondexter. And I get it. I understand that, that, that side of things, but it's also just kind of about turning over a new leaf in a certain light, in my opinion, where hiring Abdul Gaddy as the, the role wasn't really described. I, my speculation here is he's probably gonna end up being a grad assistant, but getting a dude that was a five-star recruit from the state of Washington, from Tacoma is a really big thing and a really important thing. And, you know, he can fill a specific role while still having some really awesome on-court coaches, especially when you talk about DeMarlo Slocum, when you talk about Andy Hill, like it's a really, really nice staff that he's put together. I and mean, then, as you said, you referenced the roster. Uh, no, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. What, and I was going to say, the other thing about Tony Bland is what has he been doing the last couple of years? Coaching high school basketball in California and developing some very, 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 how many more seconds? Do I have? Very, 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 <laughs> very important, right? very important yeah. relationships on the recruiting Absolutely. trail that, you know, I hinted at with Trevor Reese's son and, and a number of others, not just Trevor Reese. You're not, that's the other thing is. Danny Sprinkle is clearly not going all in on just like, oh, hey, if I get like what Hawkins did with Isaiah Stewart and Jane McDaniels, like, oh, if I get these two five stars, I'm set. I don't, I can just put role yeah. players around him. It's like, no, we need, we need dudes and dudes and dudes and dudes and dudes. Like they, and look at, that's why look at what he's already so doing on the trail. Look at what he's already done on the recruiting trail on the class of 2025, where you reference the guys that he got to sign in 2024, getting Zoom to stay on, getting Jace Butler to flip from Illinois. That's huge. That's all really big. But then he also went out there and was able to schedule a visit with Darren Peterson. It was a top three player in the country in 2025 where that's, that's big. And like, you know, when, when Mike Hopkins came over, I don't want to draw any comparisons to Isaiah Stewart because I love Isaiah. He's one of my favorite Husky basketball players of all time. He's awesome to watch truly was, but it was always, it always felt like kind of a given 
that he was going to follow him to a certain extent. I remember watching his, you know, his, his commitment. I was still living in Boston at the time and just being super hyped for it uh, just from the, the fan side of me. And I was like, Oh no, that's awesome. I, I, I love seeing that. That's all really cool. But it always kind of felt like that was going to happen. or just like reading the tea leaves, all that sort of stuff. But this just feels different. Like that's the best way to put it with what he brings on the court where we saw that really like even truly early on in the, in the Hopkins tenure where there were times where the offense would fall flat. This is not what that is. We've seen what Danny Sprinkle's offense can do. We've seen what, what just what he's been able to draw it up with. And now you combine that with some of the guys you've got returning on defense, especially when you think about Frank Kepnon, where I, if Frank Kepnon can stay healthy for a full season, I, I, I have some very, very hot takes about what this Husky team could be. With, with, with him on the roster for a full year. But you combine that with, you know, a guy like DJ Davis, who was really, really good at Butler and has had a really nice career just in terms of college basketball and Makai Mason, who you talked about there and a whole lot of these other guys, right? Where this, all of a sudden you could be looking at a roster that I truly believe can be a top five team in the big 10. That sounds bold. It does, but they have the talent and they have the coaching staff to do that. And I just, I, I really am excited about the future of Washington basketball could be under Danny Sprinkle. And I mean, I, Lars, I feel like that's probably the best place to leave it for right now. As always, thank you so much for being here. Thank you to all the engineers for tuning in. We really do appreciate your support. We've got so much more fun stuff coming for you throughout the off season right now. We're still three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, Friday is what we shoot for, but you know, when there's any big news dropping, like there might be on Friday when Donovan Olabody commits, we'll see. We're going to be dropping some special bonus episodes as well. And the best way to make sure you're just to tune in for all the latest news is that you subscribe wherever you get your podcast, whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon Music. We're there. We're everywhere. Updating this channel three times a week. Like I said, make sure you click the like on the video. Click that little bell so you no get notified whenever we post a new video. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, anything like that, drop them right down below in the comment section. And if you're audio only, please, if it's a five-star review, as it does help us out a lot. Thank you so much for tuning in, and we will talk to you on Friday.